so I think before I bring up uh, our panelists, I'd love to play a video for you guys to kind of set the stage for the conversation we're having. It's all about the changing nature of cybersecurity and what we need to be looking out for. So let's play the quick video. We've entered a new era of modern day warfare, one where tweets are considered weapons and the battlefield is full of new players. And in this new era, the barriers to entry are lower. All you need is a computer and a desire to be a part of something. This is a career choice with a short shelf life, and you need to realize that if you're going to take it on. If there's one person we could point to who created the blueprint for terror in the digital age, it was this guy, Junaid Hussein, a computer lover, hacker, a modern-day social media influencer. It's why on August 24, 2015, he would become the first hacker in history deemed dangerous enough to kill in a drone strike. So how did a smart kid with a love of computers become the picture of a 21st century terrorist? So I don't know if you're going to answer this question, but we're going to talk a little bit about it. So joining me, Rolf Rosenvigne, head of cybersecurity at PwC, and uh, Maria Ranka, who's the CEO of the uh, Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. So please, join me. Great. Great. So that was a bit from a piece I did looking at, there was this guy who was just a hacker and he liked hacking for fun. He went to cybersecurity conference type, type bits and he ended up becoming one of the most dangerous members of ISIS. And, and we looked at that and, and so much so that the US government deemed him the first hacker in history dangerous enough to kill. He was put on the, the kill list. Um, and that for me said everything about how the changing nature of cybersecurity. So I, I would love to, to start with you, um, because you are looking at this stuff all the time. Um, you have a background in the armed forces, information uh, security, crisis management, leadership, a whole extensive background. Um, what would you say is the biggest crisis we're facing now when it comes to the state of security? Well, I think that's a, that's a great question, right? And, and I, I think, you know, trying to tag along what the previous speaker talked about and you know staying positive will actually make you live longer I, I, I don't know about this guy <laughs> I but don't know if you can tie it to all of that but <laughs> no, <laughs> I dare but you to try and, and maybe I also get carried <laughs> off the stage and when we're done but no but nevertheless I, I, I do think that you know the stakes are getting higher uh, I think that's one of the main conclusions definitely and and then the question is of course why um, and I do it's it's because it's so closely tied to the transformation of our society, right? So we are becoming a true digital society. And, and I think it's like the industrialization, right? It's, it's a massive change of the society we're living in. And, and all these digital gurus, typically, right, that we meet and I engage with in, in, in various conversations, they, they like to talk about, you know, disrupt, engage, and digitize. And, and then there's one other component, right? Typically not talked about until it's no longer there, and that's trust. Mm. Uh, so, so I think we tend to forget that that's actually one of the true enablers for our digital society, which we are evolving into. Um, and I think cyber is, is the primary enabler of trust. And, and just to give a short example of you know, what trust actually means and why it's so important, that I, I guess most of you heard about in 2016 there was this uh, cyber attack at the um, Central Bank of Bangladesh on the SWIFT network and, and some hackers went in, they, they tried to exfiltrate and actually managed to exfiltrate some, something about 100 million US, I think 18 or so was mm -hmm. actually recovered later but still a lot of money. Not necessarily for a, for a global financial system but you know, for most of us a lot of money. But that wasn't really the, the biggest thing. Uh, the biggest thing was all of a sudden all the banks realizing, hey, stuff that we're shipping off to other banks is actually disappearing. Yeah. Uh, can, we, can we continue to trust that right. the receiving bank is actually the receiving bank and our, our <laughs> transaction will go through to the right party? And actually they were this close from kind of pulling a full stop to the SWIFT transactions. And just try to imagine what that would have resulted in in a recovering uh, economy post our financial crisis and everything right and i mean when you look at this idea of trust and, and cyber threat this the cyber threat that we all knew about is and we kind of talk a lot about is you know hacking and our our credit card information getting put out there companies yeah. 
uh, having valuable information putting out there. But now there's this, and I don't know if it's necessarily new, but we're hearing a lot more about it. But yeah. it's also about influence, which I think goes into this idea of trust. And can some hacker influence you in a way that you didn't even realize you were being influenced? Yeah. Another, I think that's a great question too. And yes, the, the short answer is, of course, yes, it's already happening, right? And you know, you coming from the U.S., you've been, of course, covering this. Uh, I've been extensively. brainwashed, and I don't even realize it on right? Facebook. <laughs> so, uh, so with 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 all the interference in the U.S. election, uh, we had the same, you know, in the Brexit vote, in the French uh, presidential election, and 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 then in the Netherlands. And just to give you an example again, right? The the Dutch actually decided very late to abandon their e-voting uh, system because they could no longer guarantee the integrity mm -hmm. of the results of, of the election. And when you think, start to think about those implications, and you know, someone actually going in, whether it's a nation state or an uh, APT, uh, advanced persistent threat hacker group, it doesn't really matter. But if, if you're starting to actually interfere with some of the fundamental democratic processes, interfering with a general election, right, it, it's, it's, it's not something that we any longer can just ignore, right? So, so we have to take this on collectively, I think. I, I want to ask you, Maria, like, well, you work a lot with the business community mm -hmm. here. Um, what do you think are the specific threats they're facing, you're facing here in R Stockholm? Right now? Um, I think more or less all businesses are experiencing cyber security issues, but on different levels. So sometimes it's kind of just the same old crime taking new digital expressions. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes it's much more sophisticated, advanced. You know, if someone is trying to steal your all of your your IP, for example, uh, and if that is being done by a foreign power. Uh, that is not completely new, but the scale of it is definitely new. And what's interesting, and I think because uh, this is definitely a time where you could probably, and I'm looking at you, Rolf, but I know you wouldn't do it uh, because you're a really smart and, and kind guy, but it's really a time where you can make a lot of money out of fear. And I think that is also a dangerous sort of part of this, this, and we need to sort of mitigate and understand sort of the real threats and sort of the, just the fear, uh, the fear of fear. Um, but, but what's interesting is that if we look at law enforcement authorities in this country, if we look at sort of where policymakers are uh, in regards to sort of the new kind of crime that the business community is experiencing, N knowledge is close to zero, resources are not really there, and law enforcement are not putting a lot, uh, a lot of emphasis on these new issues. I mean, and that's a, it's a good point, and we talk about business leaders trying to get on top of security. Mm -hmm. You know, in the States here, it's another day, another hack, and, and I know that costs businesses millions of dollars. Um, so how do you kind of bake in to the beginning security, especially when you're either a startup or a company, maybe you don't have as much money up front. Um, you know, how do you bake in those values? Well, and, and I think that's that's probably one of the key questions to answer, right? For, for all of us in here, and not just for us as cyber practitioners. And, and I think that's that's maybe the starting point. You know, let's not continue to divide ourselves in, in entrepreneurs and cyber practitioners mm -hmm. into various teams, right? It, it needs to be embedded, uh, like you're suggesting. And, and I think that's that's also part of, of, of the solution, right? Because this community in here, you actually have a lot of the power to s help solve this problem. And, and you know, historically, especially in this part of the, w the world, we tend to kind of rely on governments to solve stuff for us. Um, I, even though we were encouraged to stay positive, right? right it's, I, I think that's part of the solution. But I think it's not all the answers. And, and typically, you know, we see government doing a lot of stuff, uh, both locally here, but also in the EU. You have a GDPR uh, and a NIS directive and a lot of stuff being in implemented. But ultimately, that's, that's going to be reactive, right? Mm. That's responding to threats uh, or, or risks or, or scenarios. But I think what, what we collectively here can do is kind of embed it from the start. So when you design, when you code, when you think about the new solutions, you know, you have to bring in the trust component already from the start. And we can actually solve this together. Then when you say that, so how do you do it, right? So the, the, as people are building it, you want to solve it, you want to bring in those com components. Is there anything tangible you could give folks? 
Yeah, it's 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 first of all, it's it's just about you know getting into the same room and actually talking about it in this yeah. context. And and you know, I meet a lot of business leaders. Some some of them, you know, you know, just over the last six nine months, we've seen a lot of very uh, public hacker incidents, right? The, everybody heard about the Cloud Hopper incident, the WannaCry's, the Petias, and everything, right? And I met some business leaders who you know, experienced losses of three hundred million dollars, right? and they they now get you know, that why trust is important. But what we're trying to do is, is say, so okay, so these guys already experienced this. Can we now collectively learn and, you know, without having that personal experience and already from the start kind of get into the same room, get to join teams and, and realize that it, it, it actually makes business sense, right? Because the more you evolve, your digital business models and the more you rely on, on, on actually generating revenue from from whether it's an e-platform or whatever, mm. right? It you know, a, a hack will will not only cost you but it will also hurt your income side. So I think that's part of the getting to that rea realization that it's it's only by joint effort mm. and it's by sitting down talking together. I think about all the information we unknowingly share, all the <laughs> yes I accept or yeah. the what we leave behind in this yeah. digital world. I'd be curious to know from both of you, how do you think the concept of privacy has changed over the years? Like, should we even have an expectation of privacy? <laughs> uh, personally, I'm just sort of, I've, I've given up because I think sort of everything is transparent one or will eventually become transparent one way or the other. And, uh, you know, we could argue whether that is a good or bad thing, but that is sort of, it's not what maybe, not necessarily, uh, my idea of, of the ideal world, but I have given up uh, mm -hmm. personally. But I think it's interesting, I spent quite a bit of time in the US, and I think the, the concept in Europe versus the US when it comes to, to integrity is very interesting and different, because in this country, we have a very, very, you know, we're very open when it comes to um, data, even before the term data was used, mm -hmm. information that we, we handle in the public sector. Uh, information held by the government is public to everyone. And uh, my tax, when I file my tax return in this country, that is public information. Uh, and so you can find out what everybody earns in this country. And we think that is a normal thing. But then when it comes to uh, integrity on the internet, we have a very, very rigorous uh, sort of, we're, we're super scared about someone taking our data. So there is a cultural notion to this as well. Yeah, mm. no, I, I agree, right? And and so again, we, we are seeing a lot of increased, uh, you know, regulatory pressure. We have in the EU, we have a GDPR coming in, coming to play in May, and and I think that that's becoming a game changer uh, in in one way, at least here locally, um, because because they did one thing, right? They introduced a four percent global turnover fine option mm. right and everybody's super scared about that and i i think it it it, it definitely enables a lot of, of organizations to take action whether it would actually solve the privacy question is a completely different mm. one right and and that was kind of the point i was trying to make earlier also that yes governments will do stuff some of that will be actually mm. really good and useful and with the right intentions but it will not solve the entire problem and i think the answer is probably more likely to be found in this community here. A lot of I weight on you guys. You, you, can, you, <laughs> you we can actually start yeah. building the solutions that would kind of guarantee the, the, the privacy by design, but also add a lot of transparency. So I, I think most of us is probably relatively comfortable giving away stuff mm. about ourselves mm. as long as we understand what has been used for and, and who will actually use that to influence us again. Mm. Um. And again, it's the trust component to this and talking about GDPR because we're standing just before sort of the implementation of that and, and um, coming back to the previous panel on lo longevity, a lot of interesting things are going on within health tech in this very city and we're one of the strongest health tech hubs uh, in Europe and it's crucial that we still have uh, health data to mm. innovate on to actually solve issues related to serious diseases and uh, right. the challenge with longevity. Right. So, you know, we need the trust component, uh, we need to be cautious, but we still need to encourage innovation. Right. Um, 
I'd, I'd be interested to know from your take, kind of, you have your heads down in all these different types yeah. of problems. What is the one we're not expecting? What is the what is going to be the security threat that we just don't even see it that that's going to come? And you know, I know ransomware has been big and uh, all over, but what do you think is coming next? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a great question, right? So I, I think overall, I, I think the um, um, I still we're still not you know really getting our heads around the magnitude of, of nation states and their agendas and, and how they are actually already today influencing our lives and our businesses. And, you know, typically we, we live and we come from a part of Europe that's been relatively quiet for a long, long time. So intuitively we have, I think, more difficulties kind of taking on board that, that even we have adversaries. And I'm not necessarily Sweden as a whole, but uh, but you know, even we are doing business with other countries, and, and this is normal practice for, for a lot of countries, actually you know, supporting their local business. And this is already, of course, happening today, and, it, and it's, in, it's happening on a very, very sophisticated level. So I, I think that's kind of the message is to encourage everyone to kind of up their game and realize that this is already happening now. Do you think the tech companies are doing enough? I mean, you look at what just happened in the States and, and Facebook and Twitter and all these yeah. folks testifying on Capitol Hill yeah. over the extent um, of, of influence. Do you think that our social networks are, are doing enough? Because they touch all of us. You know, we, we, we work with most of them, and, and I can say that, yes, they, they definitely take the, the seriously. Uh, what Who's I think taking is it less seriously? <laughs> I think I think their clients is taking it less seriously. So mm -hmm. I think there's you know take Google for example. They, mm -hmm. you know, we we know their security team. They're great, right? But but what is still missing is their clients, their business clients. You know, really informing themselves because everybody just relies on yeah Google is great, but you know you still need to to, to you need to manage that relationship. And you to, you need to get your requirements right, and you need to understand your own business and what the threats are to your business and then have the conversation with the great Google security team. Mm. Cool. Any last words for the audience? We got to wrap. No, thank you. Solve the world's biggest problem. Yeah. <laughs> thank you guys. Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you very much. <laughs>